Good evening. I am Linda Hammes, publisher of Foreign Affairs Magazine. Welcome to Foreign Affairs Live, the series that brings the magazine to life with you, our readers, uh, so many of whom grapple with the issues in our pages on a daily basis in your professional lives and in your intellectual lives. Uh, thank you for being here and coming out in the rain. Tonight's edition of Foreign Affairs Live, produced in partnership with the Al Shark Forum, is dedicated to a look at the past, the present, and the future of the Sykes-Picot Agreement. Our five panelists and moderator bring serious intellectual firepower to this topic, and you are in for a lively discussion, to say the least. This event is on the record. It will be recorded and live streamed. Please silence your phones. And for those of you on Twitter, please join in at hashtag FA Live. Most importantly, we have a lot of smart people here tonight. I want to make the most of the Q&A session. So I ask that if you're called on, please stand, state your name and affiliation, and please ask a concise question. Now, without further ado, I welcome our speakers to the stage. Enjoy. We're all set. Well, hello everyone. I am Galip Dolay, Research Director at Al Shark Forum, also Senior Associate Fellow on Turkey and Kurdish Affairs at Al Jazeera Center for Studies. Right now, when, when, when I look at the audience, it is quite actually nice to have such a large audience, particularly on a rainy day on Friday evening. Recently, I have been to similar conferences, similar uh, couple conferences in Europe. And the difference is that there wasn't much attendance, both in London and Berlin. And that's probably, it has been 100 years on. We have been there, we've done it. So now it's American turn to take the responsibility. <laughs> so it's, you know, it's good that the Americans are, seems to be up to the challenge, given the number of the people in audience. So we have five great panelists uh, from, you know, I will just go with the order. Next to me is Imad Shahin. Imad is an expert on Middle Eastern and Egyptian politics and also like political Islam. He is the visiting professor at School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University and also editor-in-chief of the Oxford Encyclopedia of Islam and Politics. Next to him is Shadi Hamid. Shadi is, uh, I think, like known to most of you here. He is a senior fellow at Brookings Institution. Previously, he served as director of research at Brookings Institution in Doha. He is prolific writer on the political Islam. His recent book, actually, Islamic Exceptionalism, has just come out, or is going to come out next week. Next week. So, it's he's highly likely going to attract uh, much praise, but also much criticism, <laughs> as far as I'm concerned. So, and then Rachel, have a look. Rachel, she is the associate professor at uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, where she serves as a founder and director of uh, Freshwater Lab. She is the author of The River Jordan, The Mythology, the mythology of Dividing Line. And uh, she has had a very, interesting and actually very insightful article in Foreign Affairs in which basically taking a fresh look at the Sykes-Picot arrangements where she, uh, basic argument was that, you know, this is more or less done uh, based on the resource, resource line rather than any ethnic or sectarian lines. And then Joseph Bahut, Joseph is uh, the senior associate, uh, Actually, Joseph is a visiting scholar in Carnegie Middle East program. His research focuses on political developments in Lebanon and Syria, regional spillover from the Syrian crisis, 
and identity politics across the region. Joseph also previously served as a permanent consultant for the policy planning unit at French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, a country that is very much relevant to the topic that we are discussing <laughs> here today. And then last but not least, Stephen Cook. Stephen is any Enrico Mate Senior Fellow for Middle East and Africa Studies at Council on Foreign Relations where we are holding the event. So first and foremost, welcome to all of the speakers. I would like to, without further ado, I would like to start the discussion by posing the same questions to everyone here is, because one of the trouble when we talk about the Sykes-Picot is how we are going to conceptualize it. Is it an issue of border or was it an issue of order, a psychology? So starting with your first, uh, Imad, what, is the, what was the Sykes speaker like? How do you conceptualize it? Was it all about? Well, I mean, it's an iconic moment, uh, notwithstanding the, uh, a lot of controversy that has been going on about the impact of the, uh, the Sykes speaker, about the moment itself, whether it's still alive or dead or ended and so on. But definitely, it marked the end of an old order uh, that was based on totally different uh, paradigm, cultural paradigm, identity paradigm, border uh, paradigm, geographic and history. And it ushered in a new order. Uh, if we would like to look at positive things about Sykes-Picot, we can look, of course, at the, uh, the, new the basis of that new construct. And might, we might, in terms of even trying to compare between the old and, 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 and the present, even uh, look into the similarities and the differences. So two basic uh, elements that were actually present in the Sykes Pico uh, construct, uh, and I think contribute to a large extent to the birth of a new system, was the imperialist mandate. There was a system of management of that mm -hmm. transformation from an old order to a new order. And the formula, there was also a new formula, the transformation from a caliphate or a sultanate, the Ottoman Empire, into a nation state system. Uh, of course, the details, uh, there are so many uh, negatives in the details themselves that most of these borders, as you said, uh, did not coincide with the ethnic, uh, cultural, even geographic uh, affiliation uh, of the people or the communities that lived within this newly established order. That created a lot of issues. The other thing, the psychological issue is very important because I think to many, Sykes-Picot still lives with us. That's very controversial, but if you look, for example, to our education, people who were educated in nationalist schools in Arab countries, Sykes-Picot is often associated with what? Treachery, betrayal, treason, and partition. And that's the legacy of Sykes-Picot itself. It was a reflection of imperialist ambitions, greed, if you want to say so, over a uh, broken promises that were giving to a, another aspiring Im contender at that time. Imad, do you, I mean, uh, you said that it was an order, it was you know, a state system that did not correspond to the ethnic or sectarian lines. In your judgment, is this a fault or it is a fault of the, you know, the Sykes-Picot arrangements? Should the state structure or the state system in the region correspond to the identity maps of the region? I think the way to answer this question is to look into the alternatives then. Uh, there was a, a collapsing order that lasted for centuries. And before that, even if you would like to take it you know, back, the system of the caliphate and so on, and the Sharia-based system, and a new evolving system. There were two contending visions. One was by Sharif Hussein uh, himself. And that actually had roots in many attempts to establish an Arab caliphate a new, new unified Arab state that goes back to 1903 under you know, the different associations, clandestine and secret and so on. So there was this kind of aspiration for the emergence of a new Arab formation, state, caliphate, or whatever you want to call it. So that was one alternative. The second alternative is the one that we are talking about now that was proposed by the British, the French, the imperialist powers that knew, this is the system that knew then a system that uh, represents or reflects a nation state system. Whether that system was actually coincided naturally with the affiliations of the people and so on, that was a totally different question. And I think the present shows us the lingering uh, problems and, and, and positive uh, consequences of 
the establishment of that system because not, I'm not trying to you know, just really to keep, uh, uh, to undermine that completely, but at least because the, the, for me, the, the weakest element of that system was the negligence or overlooking the political development of these respective nation states. That I think the, and, and that's a problem that still exists with us. Building a, a, a well-developed political system that can integrate the different ethnic, uh, sectarian, and religious groups within the newly founded borders. Uh, Shadi, I mean, same question, but also where uh, Imad left that one of the trouble with the system was that it didn't pay attention to the difference in the political developments. So was it one of the major troubles to sex people, and how do you define it when you refer to sex people? Yeah, sure, thanks. So <clears throat> I guess the first thing that I would say is that we talk a lot about borders and whether these borders are natural or unnatural, but all borders by definition are artificial. Yeah. So if we think about a number of counterfactuals, if we had moved the border a little bit this way or a little bit that way, I, I'm skeptical that it would have been much better it could have actually even been a little bit worse. Who knows? Um, so the point here isn't where the borders were drawn, but the fact that borders were drawn in the first place. So I think that, to me, is the more important issue. And a lot of this talk about um, should, should the borders have been moved in a particular direction, I think, misses the point. And that's why I'm really happy that um, Imad mentioned this that for me the more important date, which is tied to Sykes-Pico, but it's a little, still a little bit different, is 1924, the abolition of the last caliphate. For the better part of 12 centuries, there had been a particular order in the Middle East under calif the caliphate or multiple caliphates. So for me, the bigger issue is the, I don't want to say imposition, because many people in the region were excited about nationalism, at least for a brief moment but in a way, the imposition of the nation state. So that, to me, is the big question, is essentially you're telling millions of people to transfer their primary loyalty from a religious allegiance to a national allegiance. And I think sometimes it's hard for us as kind of Western observers growing up in the US or wherever to kind of conceptualize this. But for most of Islamic history, people's allegiance was not to the state as a citizen. That is a modern phenomenon. That's a phenomenon that we've just seen in the last one to two centuries. So that, trans, that transfer of allegiance is really the key question, and it hasn't worked out so well. The idea of citizenship towards a state where all citizens are equal regardless of religion or ethnicity, for a variety of reasons that we can get into, that hasn't worked out so but well. The, was the trouble with the sykes -Pro itself, or was the trouble with the what came afterward? It was like the bad politics that could not create this allegiance. So when you say, I mean, so part, part of the issue here is it's, it's hard to know what the alternatives were. And I think it's an interesting thing to sort of run through the counterfactuals. Yes, there was a lot of bad politics. Yes, there were a lot of foreign interests that were very parochial to both the French and the British. That's certainly all true, but I can't really envision a scenario where it would have turned out significantly differently. I mean, the only significantly different outcome is if you kept some version of the caliphate. And I can't imagine that scenario unfolding as long as you had imperial powers that did not, that saw the world in terms of nation states. So the idea that there could be a broad multinational caliphate type system where people's allegiances are to their local imam or rabbi or priest, because that's essentially how it was until the last days of the Ottoman Empire, to some extent, that you had the millet system. So I mean, for anyone to envision keeping that old order, that was never in the cards. So regardless of what happened, or whether it was Sykes or Pico or some other guy with some name, it would, so it doesn't, does it really matter that it's Sykes and Pico? And I should also just mention this, too, that I've lived six of the last 12 years of my life um, in the Middle East. I have never heard a real live Arab person say the word Sykes-Pico. <laughs> Not even once. Um, and um, I think that might tell us something. Rachel, uh, I think you have a bit of different takes, but here's mostly we have spoken about 
new political order and very much focus on the political terminology, but you are bringing a different perspective, I guess. So it's very important when we hear Sykes Picot, we always think about geographic boundaries. And it's key in understanding the agreement to look underground because at the time of the agreement, a competition was on. It was a competition among Germany in the form of Deutsche Bank, England in the form of the Anglo-Iranian oil company, uh, France, their, their oil company that became total had not yet crystallized, and the US in terms of standard oil. In the late 19th century, numerous archaeologists, so-called archaeologists, were looking for biblical antiquities. They were also moonlighting, looking for oil stores. Now, the oil stores, there were Ottoman citizens who held contracts for these oil stores, but it was an imperial contest very much about it. Um, it was no secret about the oil wells of Mosul and Kirkuk. And at the time of the Sykes-Picot agreement, uh, it was a refiguring of an agreement for the Turkish Petroleum Company. The Turkish Petroleum Company basically divided these proposed stores of oil among French, uh, British, uh, and German uh, oil interests. So at Sykes-Picot, it was a key moment of driving the Germans out of the equation. It was something the Deutsche Bank didn't get over and influenced subsequent German um, work um, uh, in the imperial period. So what's really key, and, and the map is in my piece in foreign affairs, is we always call the Sykes-Picot a line in the sand. But I really want to fix that and call them pipelines in the sand. <laughs> because at the moment of the agreement, France and Britain said, we're allies in the war. We're driving Germany out. But we might not be allies in subsequent wars. We need separate pipelines. And those pipelines were built. They were finished in 1934, 1935, respectively. One went through um, zone A, the French zone of control in Sykes-Picot, and one through B into the British zone. There were two separate pipelines. And so that line of Sykes-Picot, which influenced the subsequent borders between Jordan and uh, Syria, between Iraq and Syria, are very much um, uh, to facilitate the export of oil out of the region. It makes no sense, the line makes no sense, it seems completely random until we think of that. Now, picking up this theme, you know, what if the borders had been different? I don't think that that's the question in thinking about history or in thinking the future. I think that we need to think about sovereignty in the Middle East very differently because the type of sovereignty that was developed in the nation states that emerged out of this agreement was um, a kind of a hollow sovereignty. Uh, and let me put it this way. People always talk about the kind of fierce territorial nationalism of Middle Eastern states. Well, part of that fierce territorial nationalism comes out of the fact that locals had no stake in the subterranean realm. All of that mineral wealth and oil wealth did not defer to the people that lived there. It deferred to foreign companies who also negotiated subsequent agreements where they paid no taxes. So it meant that the only way that this oil revenue could um, devolve to the public was by guarding the pipeline. And so that kind of guarding the pipeline or sabotaging the pipeline, and we can talk about this more, is um, I, you know, I don't want it to be reductionist at all, but much of that conflict was actually stoked so that whether on a national or a labor um, system, that the locals would not organize to insist that that mineral wealth was theirs or at least that they had some piece in the contract. So I think that you know, as much as we're talking about the lines, um, the lines matter much because the lines of these nation states involved a kind of a sovereignty that did not uh, control all of the underground mineral wealth. And then over time, and we can talk about this as well, came with considerable surveillance um, from the air above. So when we're talking about territorial nationalism, 
it's very much because the, the rulers were only sovereigns over that thin layer between the sky and the underground. Well, uh, I mean, Joseph, uh, what, what I took mostly from Rachel is that Sykes-Picot was mostly about <clears throat> sharing of the resources by the European powers. So it wasn't, it wasn't much about the Middle East. Was Middle East people and the elites was just bystanders? Uh, uh, not not fully and not exactly. I would I would beg to differ a little bit. Uh, of course, the oil resources were part of it. But when we talk about resources, I mean, in politics, in geopolitics, you have material resources and you have symbolic resources. And symbolic resources are some something that uh, some of you mentioned. But I think we'll talk about it later, which is identity and uh, the issue of uh, allegiance and loyalty and etc. This is also a resource. Uh, allow me just to say in the beginning of this session, and uh, since we are in the hype of the celebration of the centennial of Sykes-Picot, which is a bit, a bit too much to my, to my sense, yes. <laughs> to, re, to, to restate some, some facts and to put them straight. Okay. First of all, I mean, Sykes-Picot, we can talk about Sykes-Picot, but if, assuming we are taking it as a metaphor, as first a geographical metaphor and a historical metaphor. To be uh, rigorous, factually, the borders of today are not drawn by Sykes-Picot. Yeah. Sykes-Picot is a secret agreement between Mark Seiss and George Picot during the World War I, during the First World War, and it, in fact, crafted zones of influence. Not, uh, Jordan is not crafted by Sykes-Picot. Syria is not crafted by Sykes-Picot. Lebanon is not drafted by Sykes-Picot. Iraq is not crafted by Sykes-Picot. What Sykes-Picot did is to divide the remnants of what would become the Ottoman Empire, the remnants of the Ottoman Empire, into zones of influence. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, something that we have to keep in mind. The borders of today are, in fact, more drawn by the mandatory period, the post-colonial order. Sykes-Picot is a post-imperial order. It's the end of the Ottoman Empire and of other empires in Europe, the Prussian Empire, the Russian Empire, etc. But it's the beginning of another colonial order that gave way to the borders that we have today. This is, I think, something important. Now, on the issue of interests, uh, I mean, we also forget, and during this centennial, I think it would be interesting to remember this because there's a new player in town here which you are forgetting, which is Russia. Tsarist Russia was part of the Sykes-Picot agreement, uh, agreement. In the first place, the Sykes-Picot agreement was called sykes picot Sezonov. There was someone called Sezonov on the, on the table. However, we forget that the Russian Revolution, the Bolshevik Revolution, occurred in 2017, and this what led Russia next Soviet Union to withdraw from the agreement and to leak it to the public. I mean, it was the first WikiLeaks of, of that time, <laughs> at that moment. So uh, the, the French, the British, and the Russians had interests. Yes, I agree with you. Probably the most oriented toward oil was the British policy. It was directed towards Iraq, what is today Palestine and Jordan, and this is why they were keen at getting this region. However, Oil was not exactly or fully uh, the, the factor in the head of the French colonial power. The French were mostly, first of all, interested in curbing the UK, so balancing them, but also they were driven by the protection of minorities, and this is something we'll talk about, and this is a symbolic resource. The French policy towards the Levant at that time was driven by the protection of the Christian minorities, it was envisaging Lebanon and Syria that would become Lebanon and Syria because here also it's an anachronism. During Sykes-Picot, there's nothing called Lebanon and Syria. Mm -hmm. There's Mount Lebanon and there is Bilad al-Sham under the Ottoman Empire. It was a way to enter the Arab world. The Russian Empire at that moment was interested in both, in geopolitics, i.e. the access to the warm sea, and this is today something that is still recurrent in the Putinian, I think, uh, foreign policy. And through it, there was a religious aspect also, the protection of the Orthodox minorities in Syria and Lebanon. So all this has to be reminded. The second metaphor, if you allow me, is also a historical metaphor. When we talk about the order of Sykes-Picot, in fact, we're talking about something much wider. During these two, three crucial years, during the, the World War I, 
there were several things happening. Mark Seiss and George Picot were uh, drawing lines or pipelines in the sand. However, there were also other secret agreements that were going underway. At the same moment, during the same year, the correspondence between uh, General McMahon mm -hmm. from the British Empire and Sharif Hussein of Mecca that was promising the constitution of an Arab empire, not caliphate, an empire, an Arab empire, in exchange of the Arabs helping the allies fighting the Ottoman Empire. That was betrayed by Sykes-Picot and other things. And also there was something else being negotiated at the time that we forget to mention, which is the Balfour promise, mm -hmm. i.e. Lord Balfour from the British Empire, promising the Jewish, the Jewish Zionist organizations embodied by Lord Rothschild at that time to grant them a national homeland that would become Israel. So in fact, in that sense, the Sykes-Picot moment is a metaphor of something that happened that in fact divided the Ottoman Empire, created today's order, but not exactly today's borders. Mm -hmm. However, and this is, uh, I, th I agree with what uh, Imad has said, this has created in the Arab political culture the feeling of betrayal, meaning that the Arab uh, uh, ambition at that time was to have an Arab empire. It was betrayed first by uh, the, 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 the Sykes-Picot agreement, and then by the Balfour Declaration. This is why, and uh, Shadi, I'm, I, I'm sorry to say, that a lot of political leaders in their speeches were really vilifying the Sykes-Picot agreement. You can have Nasser's speeches talking about the Sykes-Picot agreement. Bashar al-Assad three years ago talked about the Sykes-Picot agreement, saying that ISIS and etc. is an attempt of at changing the Sykes-Picot border, and I'll end at that, and this is where the paradox is very interesting. The contestation of Sykes-Picot during the five, six decades before the 2000s was a contestation by the Arab state leadership that was aiming at uh, over, I mean, overcoming Sykes-Picot by above, i.e. reuniting the pieces of Sykes-Picot, whereby today, and I'll end on that, today the contestation of Sykes-Picot is from below meaning that these are sub-entities, the minorities, the Kurds, the Jews, the Maronites, the, the Shias, etc., that are trying to divide what was already divided. So when we talk about, uh, let's say, the negative side of Sykes-Picot, we often also confuse a, a, a contestation by above and the contestation by below. And this is, I think, very important because today we are at the moment where these two contestations are, in fact, clashing together. Joseph, I want to ask you a question, actually, because you brought something into discussion that uh, we haven't talked, uh, the previous speaker haven't talked about. The French, one of the things that prim primarily had on their mind was the issue of minorities. But as far as we can see, is not the minorities that we are talking today uh, in the Middle East. Like right now, when we talk about the minorities, that is uh, basically challenging the sykes speak order. The first one is the Kurds. Mm -hmm. Who, when it comes to the minorities, who did French have uh, on their mind? And also, uh, Rachel, I would like to also pose the same question to you, because you more or less depict a picture in which the resource was the driving factor both for French and uh, British. And Joseph is saying, well, actually, for French it wasn't the case. So No, it was. It was sorry. partly the case. Uh, here also on the question of resource, since you're asking me of, uh, about France, and then I'll say a yeah. few words about, about, about the Kurdish issue. I mean, Not the, the Kurdish, particularly the, like the in French, the French, yeah. because had that design for issue of like, okay. minority majority. The, the French strategy when during the negotiation of Sykes-Picot was driven by two factors. Of course, the protection of the Christians of the Levant, mainly the Maronites, who were the, mm -hmm. the clients and protégés of, of France, but also through that, there was something else. It was uh, economic interest, not oil. It was the protection of the contours of the, of the ports that France established along the coast. One of them was Beirut at that time, very famous port and very important. And this was in fact to assure, to, to guarantee the trade of silk and other uh, goods between Marseille and France and the Levant. And by the way, uh, one of the reasons of the creation of Greater Lebanon in 1920, so lay, way after Sykes-Picot, was a pressure by uh, the, 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 the silk lobby in France and the Catholic lobby that chose to create uh, Lebanon. Talking about that, this is the answer to your question. 
when we say today with a bit of retrospective simplification that Sykes-Picot did not in fact respect the, board, the minority and the ethnic lines and etc. And here, uh, small nota bene, I agree with Shadi. In fact, every other border wouldn't have been sure. natural, but we'll talk about that. But if you look at Sykes-Picot and at this moment, at this metaphor and the legacy of it, in fact, not all the minorities were losers. Mm -hmm. Some of them were losers. I think the biggest loser was the Kurdish, or the Kurdish minority or ethnic, uh, ethnic minority or ethnic group. However, other ethnicities in the region were winners. The Maronites in Lebanon were the biggest winners of this moment. They got, uh, they got the victory of their national project of Lebanon. Mm -hmm. The Jews were big victors also of that project since uh, the Balfour Agreement and then 1948 granted them a national homeland in the Middle East, which was also a victory. Probably some forgotten minorities at that time, for example, the Shiites, the Jews. We, at that time, you couldn't talk about Sh Shiites. You, you would talk about Muslims in general, the Shia minority that we mm -hmm. are considering today as a component at that moment was still within the Islamic majority. But however, by taking some sub-states within what would have been a biggest national empire, a national Arab empire, in fact, they guaranteed more or less their participation in power, be it in Iraq, in a way, under the Hashemite uh, kingdom, be it in Lebanon, of course, be it, uh, if you accept the premise, but I would discuss it, that the Alawites are uh, remote cousins of the Shiites, they got also a share of power in Syria. So not all minorities mm -hmm. were uh, completely frustrated by this moment that we call now by commodity tonight and this mm -hmm. year, the Sykes-Picot moment. So I think that also we have to be very cautious when we talk about that. It leads us to a very crucial question for the future, which you all laid mm -hmm. down, what to do now? I think the question is, Outcome these borders that, or not, what to do now has nothing to do with withdrawing the border. It has to do with reshaping the political order. We'll have a second round. Rachel, quickly, if you want to take that, and then I want to go to Stephen. I, I would say that no matter the moment of um, political rule for certain ethnic minorities, I don't think in a broad way that, that really any minority group gained from this order. Because if we look at the Ottoman moment, people were not divided by ethnicity or religion or sect. They thought of themselves, of course, of members of these groups, but they were also members of a region. And the region was integrated economically, in certain ways integrated culturally. And so this idea of pressing ethnicities and stoking political competition went with this order of the nation state. And the ethnic groups noticed it. They noticed that if they came as the Socialist Party, the Communist Party, the, the people of Mosul, there was no recognition by the imperial powers. But if they came forward as the Alawites, as the Jews, as the Kurds, although that's a, a particular story, um, they would be recognized as an ethnic group. So suddenly the cue to people on the ground was, we'll only listen to you if you represent yourselves in terms of ethnic nationalism. And so those pressures, once put in place, were stressed more and more. And for example, the, uh, the oil companies exploiting the region noticed it very well. Uh, labor was divided ethnically. Certain groups were in management, certain groups were in labor, certain groups were brought in to finance, and this was very much a concerted effort so that there would be no uprisings, whether, I mean, there were, but they were, they were put down, um, whether by labor movements, whether by locals, or whether by people as an integrated national group. So I think in the long term, knowing what we know about 100 years of this history, that even these short-term gains led to a, a kind of a really devastating loss of an unstable life in a highly militarized region of the world. Stephen. Particularly after the Syrian crisis, I mean, during the early period of the Arab uprising, there was like, you know, much talk of the regional integration and et cetera, et cetera, whether inflated or not, another question. But after the Syrian crisis, particularly at some quarter, more and more we hear the Saxpico order and everything to blame upon it. So to what extent 
we can blame today's ills in the region on what is called sex order or border or whatever? Well, uh, thanks for the question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think, you know, I, I, my colleague here, Joseph, articulated extraordinarily well much of what I was going to say about the mm -hmm. actual facts of the Sykes-Picot. And I think as we were discussing over email earlier today, that there is a certain kind of, uh, you use the term psychological, I would use the term more of a kind of inkblot kind of interpretation of what Sykes-Picot mm -hmm. is and what it actually represents. And, and I think that the historical facts are clear that Sykes-Picot did not set up states, didn't set up borders, it didn't produce the map that we now know of as the Middle East, a map that may or may not be changing. Uh, but it seems clear that somehow this idea that Sykes-Picot is the wellspring of the region, a wellspring of all the problems, has somehow been latched on. It's as if some big-footed journalist read this somewhere, and then everybody read it, and it was kind of a game of telephone, because they said, oh, this is the end of the Sykes-Picot, that, that that sounded quite poetic, and now everybody's kind of latched onto it and said, well, it's the end of Sykes-Picot, clearly. And I'm not quite sure what that means, because Sykes-Picot essentially ended in 1918. Uh, as soon as the, in, in fact, even before, as soon as the Russians pulled out of the war because of the Bolshevik re Revolution, as, as Joseph pointed out, the French and the British, although they had collaborated in World War I, had not actually put aside their colonial competition. And the British decided, well, we don't actually need this agreement any longer. And um, we're more concerned about how Sykes-Picot ceded certain parts of, certain zones of the region to, uh, to the French, and there, therefore sought to undermine it completely. Where I differ from, from Joseph on this question is, I'm not quite sure exactly what it means to suggest that there is a Sykes-Picot order as a result. Um, I think that the order came in the form of the post-World War I agreements uh, and, the mandatory, uh, and the, ma the mandatory agreements that actually did set out borders of states or proto-states. Um, I think the idea of nationalism and ethnicity actually predates uh, this, uh, this period. There were stirrings of Egyptian nationalism, uh, obviously Christian Maronite around Lebanon uh, nationalism uh, uh, emerged, Jewish nationalism, the World Zionist Congress actually first happened in the late 19th century rather than was a product of this period. So Sykes-Picot was really a failed colonial kind of experiment that was happening in the middle of the war, responding to certain conditions at the moment that Mark Sykes and, and George, George Picot and Cezanne got together, although the Russians weren't as deeply involved in this. Now, can we blame everything? I think it's a what we can say about this period and the subsequent period, the Treaty of Sevres, the Treaty of San Marino, all of these things afterwards, is perfectly consistent with what my co-panelists have said, which is that there was a worldview that was espoused by European colonial powers that was uh, intended in a way to kind of build up minorities and, and get these countries, these countries in the making ready for, uh, for self-governance, but actually what the colonial powers were interested in was resources, access to waterways, this is that the physical environment of the region was extraordinarily important to them. And then subsequently, in the decolonization period in the mid part of the 20th century after World War II, new nationalist leaders came to power. Nasser, Boumedian, later on Assad, uh, Saddam Hussein, others came to power and there was a political imperative on their part to run against things like Sykes-Picot, because they had to set themselves out as nationalists par excellence. That's why Sykes-Picot shows up in Gamal Abdel Nasser's speeches. That's why Sykes-Picot actually shows up in Bashar al-Assad's speeches. Bashar al-Assad, on the eve of the uprising against him, said, it can't happen here because I'm a good nationalist. I am the leader of the rejectionist front against, uh, against the Israelis. So it has become, as I said, a metaphor. It has become something to be used as a political cudgel regardless of what the facts of the situation is. So in that sense, maybe psychology is a good word. Maybe a mindset. I, I prefer to say it's an inkblot. We look at this agreement. We try to, we try to 
tell a, a narrative based on it. And I think the best that we can suggest is that it spoke to a moment, and it had a series of political and geographic repercussions, but it did not set out borders. It did not produce these kinds of uh, ethnic and sectarian differences. And really, the borders that we see are based on, in fact, um, not only the presence of natural resources and, 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 and physical barriers, but Ottoman administrative units. <laughs> Ottoman, it was pretty much consistent with the way in which the Ottoman Empire had broken things up. I'll stop there. Yep. Uh, well, in the second session, I will start actually with you because oh, so I got <laughs> double double shot here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, because during the time of Sykes Speaker, we we're talking about European colonial powers, including Russia. Now, hundred years on, basically on you know on a few major Middle Eastern crises, we mentioned the name of Europe, and there is not a single Middle Eastern crisis in which we will not talk about Americans. So in this regard, particularly from the region, look at the American, you know, on any major issue, the first thing that you do to try to understand where America is standing. So today, the region is full of, you know, Celtic, it's chaos all over the place. But if we try to like project five years, 10 years from now on, try to see a post chaos regional order, does America has, you know, any vision for a post-crisis region? <laughs> Thanks again for the question, Gal. Um, look, I think, first of all, uh, there, is, there is this emphasis on the United States, I think be, primarily because the United States became the preeminent and predominant power in the region not 50 years ago, not 40 years ago, but 25 years ago. Yeah after uh, Operation Desert Shield and Desert Storm. We were the predominant uh, military power and diplomatic power. And there was a moment after that when the United States really could drive events in the region. Over time, I think that that has diminished greatly. And I think if you look at the difference between uh, Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and Operation Iraqi Freedom, even in the conduct of both of those, those conflicts, we can see the, the, the difference in uh, the relative uh, efficacy of American, uh, of American power in the region. Um, I, I, I do not want to hazard to guess what the United States or the region is going to look like five to ten years from now. I must say uh, I was part of a meeting, uh, a, a fairly high-level meeting on December 13, 2010, talking about the dominant trends in the Middle East, and after a day-long conversation, we decided that the dominant trend in the Middle East was political stability. Of course, this was four days before <laughs> Mohammed Bouazizi lit himself on fire in the city of Bouzid and launched the Arab uprising. So uh, my, my, my capacity for prognostication a number of years out has been drastically <laughs> compromised as a result of taking part in that meeting. But what I will say is this, <laughs> is that it strikes me that even with that episode and everything that has happened since, what the United States is doing is responding to outcomes that Arabs themselves have produced. And that we, to the extent that Egyptians, to the extent that Tunisians, to the extent that Palestinians and Israelis, to the extent that Saudis and Kurds and Turks are defining their conflicts in existential terms. Remember, after the Egyptian, uh, the coup d'etat that ended uh, Mohamed Morsi's brief tenure as Egypt's president, a lot of what uh, Egyptian, uh, Egyptian liberals and, and activists who supported the military's intervention were saying, this is about the heart and soul of Egypt, that there are identity conflicts, that the kind of capacious failure of the region, which is not the fault of the United States, although we had contributed to it through a number of ill-conceived uh, policies and adventures in, in the region, that... Um, the, the, the failures of the region, the failures of the of, uh, Arab Republican system, the failures of the Muslim Brotherhood's form of governance, the failures of those who helped create the uprisings to transform that extraordinary moment into actual political gains, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, has accentuated these kinds of identity conflicts that had been there for quite some time. And Arabs are now defining their internal struggles that way. I, I find it hard to imagine what kind of resources or influence the United States can bring to bear to make a significant difference in those kind of core struggles that are going on within countries in the Middle East. There's certainly things that we can do. We can uh, 
do, we do certain things very well. We can relieve suffering. We can provide people with kind of technical assistance. We can even bring an end to the existence, the, the kind of organized existence of the Islamic State through bombs. But, but, and while you know, warheads are extraordinarily efficient at killing human beings, they're not efficient in killing sentiment and ideology. And that's up to people in the region. And that's where I think the United States, we're kind of hamstrung. We, we sit down in this, in this city and we say, OK, how can we help? What can we do? And that comes from a laudable place. But sometimes we have to recognize, and I write about this a lot in my new book, Sometimes we have to recognize that these are conflicts that are happening within these countries, and the solutions to them are within these countries, as hard as it is to imagine. Joseph, I mean, Stephen says, basically, the Middle Eastern has to put their, or their house in order. America can help, but it's not going to be decisive. But when we look at, the, even though, like many panelists said, that sex actually was stillborn or was, you know, was defunct by 1980s, but nevertheless, as a psychology, it's, it still lingers on. Uh, when the President Barzani of the KRG declared, well, a, you know, a prospective Kurdish state will mean the end of the sykes -Picot. On the other hand, meaning like you know, a new Kurdish national state, on the other hand, the ISIS claimed that basically the you know, termination of the border between Iraq and Syria, creation of a supranational or global ummah will mean the same end. So in the region, we see two trends. One of them is, well, supranational. I don't know what that means. The other one is like, you know, let's further fragmentation, create further oh. national state as a response. We don't see few voices that argues in favor of strengthening the current national states. So how do you see where the, where do you see the, you know, the solution lying? Like break up, further integration, strengthening the current nation states? Uh, just a quick note to, sure. to uh, an ironic note to, to uh, prolong what uh, or to, to perpetuate what um, what uh, Steve was saying. We like it. The U.S. was present, in fact, indirectly in the sykes picot moment because, in fact, we the see. only power at that time that really contested sykes picot and, and and the Versailles Treaty and etc. was Woodrow Wilson after after the war American and exceptional and yeah and, and, and <laughs> at that moment he was it was the first moment where the Middle East heard about something called self-determination right and Wilson pressured the League of Nations at that time to send a commission the King Crane Commission and here I uh, this is something that contradicts a little bit what you said the King Crane Commission made a poll in the Arab region in the Levant at least mm -hmm. And many of the findings were not exactly that we want to live in a kind of supranational mm -hmm. uh, entity. It was much more nuanced than that, but this is not the place to get into these very minute details. To get back to your question, uh, I mean, I said before that what's interesting is that for a long time, Sykes-Picot was contested by above, i.e. the legitimacy in the Arab world, in the, in the Middle East, was to say the West divided us. It's a plot we have to find again the way to unity, to recreate a supranational Arab nation that will solve all the problems. And also the Islamists had the sim similar Okay, similar this idea. failed, this failed. After 2000, and mainly the American invasion in Iraq, we started to hear exactly the contrary. People saying in the region, oh, now these states are imposed on us by colonialism, whereby, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, we were accepting them in a way, and then now we have to, to let's say, to, to divide them themselves in order to accommodate our sub-identities. Shias in Iraq, Kurds in Iraq, uh, some people in Syria, voices in Lebanon during the, the, the civil war, and etc. This leads us to the question that you are raising, which is, I think, the exact question of today. As Shadi Hamid has said, all borders are artificial. That's I mean, true. take other empires that crumbled after World War I. The, the, the Austro-Hungarian um, Empire crumbled. It gave way to the Balkan and Eastern Europe. We, hadn't ha we haven't had decades of endless wars in this period, although we had troubles there. That means to say that all the problems of the Arab region and Arab societies in the Arab discourse, and Shadi Hamid can say much about that uh, through the Islamic, uh, Islamist, let's say, rhetoric, tends to blame everything on this congenital moment, I mean, on this DNA, that we have inherited bad boundaries, 
So our political life is bad. But this is not the good question. The question is, OK, you have inherited whatever you have inherited. During this century, the, the 20th century, we are now 100 years after this moment of crafting up, of carving up the region. What was exactly the record of the states that inherited this moment in order to create good governance, integration, loyalty, uh, acceptance of coexistence between uh, minorities and etc. Nothing. Nothing partly because the entire discourse, discourse tended to reject any political reform under the name that we have inherited bad borders, we have to craft them again. Today, it's ironic to see, to see that the only real power in the Middle East that is contesting Sykes-Picot from above is ISIS. In fact, it's, we, we like it or not, but ISIS, in fact, is the only power, the only uh, power broker in the Middle East that is talking about reunifying, not the Arab nation, but the Islamic Ummah. But however, if you look at it more or less, it is more or less the same. Versus that, confronting that, you have only a discourse of let us shape minorities and let us shape sub-identities from below in order to answer the same governance deficit. I think that if we don't stop this game between supra and sub, we are keeping probably this region in a kind of vicious circle. The proper answer is to say, OK, you have states. They are worth what they are worth. However, let us work on ameliorating, on, on enhancing the governance within these states, yep. and also probably of thinking of a new political architecture between these states, i.e. a regional order that would accept, recognize, respect, accommodate the sub-identities, but however not compromising on supra-identities and on things that would also probably supersede the boundaries of today's state. I think that when the dust will settle after this decade Probably we still have a decade of mayhem and, mm -hmm. and chaos in the, in the region. I'm sorry to be bleak. But after that, if the Middle East has to live more or less peacefully in the world order, this is, I think, the only leeway it has, i.e. to accommodate diversity and unity in a very inventive way. And by the way, we are living in a country here in the US where this has been done, I mean, uh, more than 200 years ago. Uh, Rachel, uh, again, you know, a quite different question for you. Uh, in your, again, in your recent article in Foreign Affairs, for you, you said, for Middle East to, in a sense, to enter a post-Sykes-Pico Middle East system, two concepts were very important. One of them is sovereignty over resources, not territory, mm -hmm. and then local ownership of these sovereignties you propose as two key concepts for the Middle East to go to have a post-Sykes-Pico uh, post Middle East system. But the question is, how are we going to get there first? OK. OK. So just as, as I said before, the central problem, as I see it, of Sykes-Pico are not the borders that were drawn, but the alienation from all of the resources, wealth generating and stabilizing. So I think that we do see a very interesting test case in the Kurds and in the KRG, where you have a case following 2007 when oil contracts were renegotiated. Um, the Kurds ended up with a percentage of those oil contracts. This has been very key because we've seen the most effective local army or militia in the face of ISIS has been the Peshmerga. It's not incidental because you have local members, local people, who have a lot to lose um, beyond symbolic capital or even their homes. Not that those things are incidental, but they have a stake in the resources and in the value of where they live. Now, it's a key case, and I think that it paves the way forward with a caveat. I think that exactly this moment is the time to not use ethnicity as the index of who has what in terms of economics or political power. Rather, it should be um, by region and by place. So as I'm sure many of you know, there's a huge contest going on right now in Iraq uh, with the KRG and the Iraqi central government. Um, it's, a, it's a contest about uh, government revenues, and it's a contest about 
oil contracts. I do think that um, the new contracts being negotiated should um, go to the KRG, but I think at the same time, it can't be on a Kurdish basis. Right, part of why I um, admire the KRG beyond um, the, the successes of the Peshmerga is because they're also absorbing a high number of refugees and they are building these local coalitions with other groups. So I think you know, the, the caveat to them is, okay, you're in the oil contracts, but it's not coming to you as Kurds, it's coming to you as members of northern Iraq. I don't think that we need dissolution of borders. I'm with Joseph on that, that there's a kind of um, uh, a need much more to, um, to infuse more power in place. And so just as the, the Kurds, as representatives of northern Iraq, should hold those contracts with their partners, I also think that that should be the case um, for the, the local militias and members in Syria who are fighting ISIS. I think the time is there for them to hold the oil and gas contracts. It's a great way for people to raise an army with revenue that doesn't come from um, the United States. Well, Rachel, I mean, normatively, it is you know, quite an original idea, mm -hmm. but how are we going to you mm -hmm. know, convince the current nation states that has the ultimate authority over these uh, resources to basically you know, compromise uh, their authorities? Well, I mean, sadly, the, the moment is there because of the virulence of ISIS. I mean, effective armies are needed immediately um, to even begin to assuage the suffering of, of the people on the ground. It, as we know as Americans, it, it takes quite a lot of money to build an effective <laughs> army, and uh, money isn't the only component. You need people who are willing to sacrifice and have quite a lot to lose. So it's why I, I would really begin with the Kurdish case. They're pressing right now for stakes in those contracts. They're, price, they're uh, pressing right now to open avenues for the export of oil in northern Iraq. So they want those contracts very badly. They need the revenue. I, I would say all of us need, um, need for them to have the revenue um, in their fight against ISIS very badly. But I think it's the perfect condition. And they're motivated by a certain, not, I, I can't speak for everyone, but by a certain form of ethnic nationalism. But I think it is, you get this contract as northern Iraqis, right, including everybody. Perfect. Two last and short questions. Yeah. One, shout it to you. Uh, I mean, I pose the same question to Stephen. Is America really, uh, does America really have such a limited uh, power or influence to play a role in a prospective regional order that might emerge in this post-crisis area? Yeah, sure. So um, <clears throat> just to kind of start on, start on that, I mean, so we're talking about Sykes-Picot as sort of like a, a sensibility, a disposition, an inkblot, a metaphor, which I like a lot. So, um, but, but it's a kind of, it reflected a kind of sensibility at the time, this patronizing attitude towards the Middle East. And you know what, I, I've been thinking about this more as of late, um, when I think about Obama. Obama, in some sense, I think a lot of the way we talk about the Middle East here in DC has, has some of this same kind of patronizing attitude and I think that it's a huge problem. That, and Obama made this very clear in his Atlantic profile with Jeffrey Goldberg. He was talking about um, Muslims in general and Arab Muslims in particular. Oh, they're, they're tribal. Look at those Arab Muslims who aren't nice technocrats like the people I meet with in Asia. Very, this level of disdain and contempt, which I find remarkable coming from out of all people Obama, which gets me to the bigger point that um, you know Obama's approach to the Middle East is just a slight variation on Sarah Palin's let them eat cake and kill each other in the Middle East. Let, let a law sort it out. It's actually not that different. And um, this is where I think I would part ways a little bit with, with Stephen. I think there's much more the US could do. It's more a question of political will. For me, the major takeaway of the Arab Spring is not that the US doesn't have leverage or that external actors don't matter much. It's actually the opposite. If we look at, I would say, five of the six stalled or continuing revolutions, five of the six, but in particular, four of the six, 
um, external actors have not just played a significant role, they've played a decisive okay. role. If anything, I would say outside powers matter more today than really, you know, perhaps any time in recent years or even decades. That to me is the major lesson. Of course, what that would require is a massive commitment and I don't want to, um, so I'm a little bit on the interventionist side on these issues. And this is where I think it's unfortunate that we don't talk about nation building has become a bad phrase. We don't talk about that. So in, in some sense, it's a question of are we as Americans willing to commit the kind of resources, time, and attention, and seriousness to really helping the Middle East rebuild itself? I think we could if we really wanted to. But our leaders, people like Obama, but for that matter, most of our leaders don't really have the stomach for it. And I think that is where the problem is. So, uh, well, last question. Uh, I mean, uh, Joseph laid out a bit. One of the trouble, particularly in the Arab Middle East, for quite some time, the two major ideological currents, Arab nationalism and Islamism, none of them attach much importance to the current state border, the current states. And that was one of the factors that lessened the consolidation of these states. Do you see any change in this regard? So do you see any new ideological current, maybe like, you know, putting a bit more emphasis on the, uh, on the you know, what we have at present state-wise? All right, let me just, you know, by the way of trying just to summarize and wrap up, because in the uh, beginning of your question, the first question that you asked me, I tried to allude to two things, two elements that were very important in the transformation of the old order and the building of the new order. One was administrative ma mandate, the mandate itself, mm -hmm. which we can consider as an administrative will in order to effect this transformation. And the second one is the formula itself. Now, how can we translate this into nowadays? How can we go past Sykes-Pico. Going past Sykes-Pico or the end of Sykes-Pico doesn't mean new partitions, and it has to be clear in our minds, because new partitions based on ethnic or sectarian or religious or regional or factional states is not going to carry, and it's not going to really to resolve the issues. It might even aggravate the situation further. So if we are talking about you know, like what's needed nowadays in order to move on, one is a collective will. A collective will of not only international, it has to be domestic, domestic, regional, and international. A domestic will in order to find the second element, a formula for the entire region to move forward. It cannot you know, just kept like this, let the fire burn itself out, and then we'll see what will happen. Because that fire is likely to burn everyone on the ground. So the new formula is basically what we're looking for is what? Something that can integrate the people, can include them in some kind of a political order or a, a formula, so something that can provide represent, representation, it can provide also decision making, and a, an equitable share of natural resources. That's what we call actually democracy, a democratic system. So when you talk about, for exam example, Islamist, this is very macro now, yep. very macro. Because you know, even if I tell you, yes, Arab nationalists can do uh, miracles, Islamists can do miracles because you know, they can go past Sykes-Pico. But what you need actually is the process itself. That's what we fo need to focus on, a collective will to create a new process. I fully agree with Shad. We are moving away from the nation state. We are moving straight from the uh, away from the state of, uh, of uh, from the process of state building, and this is a mistake because actually at that moment, what's needed actually a let's say a, a coherent state. I'm not going to say a, a strong, of course, the ideal thing, a strong state, strong society. But what is needed is a coherent state that can achieve the objectives that I allude, I alluded to: representation, integration, inclusion equitable share of resources. Thank you. Well, before going to Kane's session, actually here uh, something interesting came up. So I want to have a very quick vote count. Do you think the audience, do you think that the US should do more and involve in the nation or state building in the Middle East? So the one who thinks, please raise hand. Or more hands? The, come on, come on, people. <laughs> <laughs> Not you. Or, so, should U.S. basically stay away from the Middle East and leave the stage for the Middle Easterners? Raise hands. Yeah, 
Wow. <laughs> so, Can I just say one word on this point? Let's go to question and answer. <laughs> okay. One more remark to Q Joseph and then... Let's do Q&A, Gallup. Okay. Let's do yeah, and then... Okay. Let's do okay. Uh, first, yes, yes. Uh, on the second row. Thank I will you. collect three questions in a row and then turn to the panelists. The second one and then the third one. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. My name is Saeed Erkat. I'm a Palestinian journalist here in town. Uh, first of all, I'm amazed at the notion that Arabs don't talk about sykes Pico. I don't know which Arabs are those. Or, or the notion that, that external power is good when Libya is a stark example as why not intervene. My question is to Mr. Joseph Bahoud. Uh, you know, at this centennial event of Sykes-Pico or the Belfort Declaration, and 50 years after the complete conquest of Palestine, how do you see the Palestinian-Israeli conflict moving forward? Right. Thank you. The second one, gentleman in the second row here. Yeah, oh. there, Mike is there. And then... Uh, uh, the thank you very yeah. much. Um, my question is about Oh, Mustafa Malik, I'm a freelance journalist and writer in Washington. <clears throat> my question is, my assumption is that the national, nationalist concept that was rather imposed at the end of the First World War has not worked. You, there are no Iraqis in Iraq. There are only Sunni Arabs, Shia Arabs, Kurds, and others. There are no Lebanese in Lebanon. There are only Shiites and Sunnis and, you it's know. concise. Yeah. So the question is, if the secular nationalist order has not worked, what could be the paradigm for people to or, or, uh, organize? Whom you're asking? To whom you're asking your question? Oh, my first question is to uh, Shadi Hamid and Joseph. OK, Joseph and Shadi Hamid. And the third one is, yeah, here. Hi, Brian Stout, Foreign Policy. I wanted to ask, this is for anyone on the panel who would want to take it, whether, whether the Arab experience of being subjugated to Ottoman rule shaped uh, the current dynamics today in ways that may not have been addressed yet. I'm thinking specifically in light of when you look at countries uh, that had less history of being directly governed from Istanbul, or were never subject to Ottoman rule at all, thinking particularly like with regard to Tunisia and Morocco, uh, these are the countries that seem to have healthier and more robust political institutions uh, going forward. Okay, uh, Joseph, first you, you have two questions, and then also I think you had a Very mark. quickly, I mean, the Arab-Israeli the Arab question or the Palestinian-Israeli question, I think is central to this moment of Sykes-Picot. First of all, historically, because as you said, the Balfour Declaration and the Sykes-Picot moment were concomitant. Um, I mean, I would say that, that, I mean, the Palestinian entity, Palestine, as, as a quote unquote, don't take it, I mean, I, I'm using a word really in the literary sense of the, in a fic, as a fictional entity, because Palestine never existed, in fact, because it was a province under the Ottoman Empire, and then it became partitioned with Israel. So in fact, it is the victim first of the Sykes-Picot moment as a metaphor, if we use it. The second, I think, uh, the, I mean, the second factor that probably is, is making the, the Palestinian issue a victim of later development is something that has also to do with the unraveling of the Sykes-Picot order, which is in fact the, the fact that Palestine and the Arab-Israeli question is becoming less and less central to the issues of the region. Uh, probably you know better than me that today in the discourse in Arab politics or towards the region, you have this kind of cliche, which is partly true, that today's crises in the Middle East, ISIS, Islamism, democracy, governance, uh, revolutions, borders, etc., are rendering the Arab-Israeli question or the Palestinian-Israeli question a marginal one. And you have a serious academic debate and policy debate that probably this is no more the central issue of that region. It's no more the mother of all conflicts, which is something I don't agree with. So this is the second uh, uh, reason why probably Palestine is the victim not only of the Sykes-Picot moment, but of the unraveling of Sykes-Picot also. Last but not least, and you are asking me the question, I'm happy for that because uh, as, as, as Ghalib said, I'm partly French. 
today, on the 3rd of June, you know that in France there was a very important summit uh, convened by Paris, by France, to try to restore, to put uh, new life in the, in, in the moribund peace process between the Arabs and, and, the, Palest and, and the Israelis and between mainly the Palestinians and, uh, and the Israelis. And you know that the peace process is today almost dead. Uh, it is a disaster for many people in this capital, which, uh, in fact, were living out of this business, of this unending <laughs> business. Um, so France is trying today to rejuvenate this process by injecting a new idea. It can work, it cannot work. I don't know, I don't want to, to, to take my bet on that. But I think that saying today with much easiness that the Palestinian question is no more a central question to the instability of the Middle East is maybe mechanically something that you can prove in the short run. However, in the long run, at least in terms of political culture, of ideology, of identity in this region, I think that this is something wrong. And you can go a long way. You will get back to the necessity of addressing uh, the Palestinian question. This is my view, at least. You had a second question as well, the uh, gentleman. Can you very quickly remind me about the question? My assumption is that nationalist movement, nationalism has not worked. Yeah. Because there are no, because there are no Iraqis in Iraq. There are only Sunni Arabs, Shiite Arabs, and Sunni Kurds. Okay. Similarly, in Lebanon. So what I am saying, that how can you build a new order that responds to the sensitivities of the people, okay. ethnic and religious? I got it. very very quickly. Shadi will probably go longer than me. Uh, it depends on what you understand by nationalism. You, you know, there are two definitions of nationalism. You have the nationalism that is a kind of inherited notion of uh, blood, belongingness, and etc. If that is the case, of course, I don't see a lot of nations on the face of the, of the planet, frankly. Now, if you agree that nationalism is a kind of social contract, a free willingness to associate and to create a state and live together and then create a national identity, I think that all societies that create a place where to live, and this uh, we get back to the issue of artificiality, if it is properly governed and uh, extracts the adhesion of people to it, can create its own nationalism. So I don't think that nationalism is dead forever in this region. Now, of course, nationalism can also be uh, perceived in a, in a very chauvinistic sense of the term, and I think that this is probably something the, the Middle East should, uh, should avoid again. To clarify, so, uh, so, okay. sorry, uh, we have... We, to clarify nationalism, I'm talking about... We don't have... Concept of okay. We don't have so much time. this is the second Sh definition. Shadi. Shadi. Okay, so, uh, so let me just... Libya was mentioned, so I feel like I, I have to say something on this, because I, I find this to be bizarre that the conventional wisdom in DC is that the Libya intervention was a failure. It was not a failure. It succeeded according to its own stated goals, which was stopping an impending massacre. It was about to happen. And um, I think we're also seeing um, the dangers of non-intervention. And Syria is what we have to look at there. So just as intervention, the Iraq invasion 10, uh, 12 years ago, was dangerous, so too can non-intervention be dangerous. And I think that Obama's Iraq will be Syria, or maybe Obama's Iraq will be also Iraq. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But, um, <laughs> but on, on the question of nationalism, um, so, so part, of, uh, part of the problem here is that Islamic law was designed for the pre-modern era, because Islam, the Quran, was revealed in the 7th century. So, Islamic law is not meant for the nation state. Actually, Islamic law is not a good fit for the nation state. Islamic law was traditionally decentralized. It depended on a semi-autonomous clerical class. There are no longer semi-autonomous clerical classes in the Middle East because the state dominates everything. The state controls the production of ideology and religion, um, and clerics are appointed by and large by the state. So the question is, how do you take these pre-modern concepts and accommodate them to the nation state? Unfortunately, there isn't actually a good answer to the question, which is why there is going to be a perpetual tension, at least for the rest of our lives. Um, it can be better in a way, and this is where I would just draw on what Imad said. I think what we need to have is 
I was thinking about how you talked about strong states. Ideally, you want strong states and strong societies. Yeah. But you can almost never have both in the Middle East because the strong state will overwhelm everything else. So what I would actually suggest is, this isn't the best way of putting it. I was just thinking about it right now. But maybe um, weaker but legitimate states. So a state that is legitimate, that is um, that the people see it as legitimate, the state is somewhat responsive to those people. Um, but at the same time, the state is somewhat decentralized. Power is distributed away from the central state. You have federalism, decentralization, local communities kind of doing their own thing to at least some extent. And the problem is everyone is obsessed with the powerful centralized nation state. Even, I mean, it's not just nationalists. It's Islamists, too. I think one of the biggest mistakes Islamists have made, and I'm talking here about mainstream Islamists like the Muslim Brotherhood or, or the Ak Party or whatever, they fell in love with the nation state. They became obsessed with the nation state. They couldn't see beyond the nation state. Uh, on the third question, would you, does anyone want to take the third oh, Ottoman, question? Yeah. Ottoman? Yeah, okay. yeah, sure. And well, the connection Stephen. between Ottoman legacy and authoritarianism or the uh, prevalence of uh, authoritarianism in certain countries and Tunisia and Morocco, least influenced by Ottoman legacy, are doing better. The Ottoman legacy has not been uniform in the, in the Middle East throughout, throughout the centuries. Like if you look at Egypt, for example, Egypt has been practically autonomous since the early 19th century, uh, even though it was an Ottoman province and everything. Yemen, the same thing. Uh, Tunisia and Morocco are really particular cases, very special cases, and the dynamics are uh, emanating from uh, domestic. They are internal. The dynamics, uh, the internal dynamics from within itself. Morocco, as an Alawite di dynasty, one that has the most continuous historical uh, 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 evolution or co uh, continuity since 1666. It has gone through, it has not always been tolerant and benevolent or, or relatively uh, 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 accepting as we see it now. I mean, it went through also authoritarianism and repression until we get into this 1961 and the constitution that stipulated a pluralistic political system. So it allowed for the existence of pluralism from uh, uh, the beginning or immediately after independence for a specific reason and for an obvious reason that the king is above all political parties and cannot be challenged. That's the reason. Tunisia, for example, also the internal dynamics and maybe the early evolution of Bourguiba as a character, a, a, a lawyer, liberal information in the beginnings, uh, educated in the Sorbonne, also uh, uh, built some kind or had some kind of a, an image for Tunisia, turned authoritarian. But I think the basic thing in Tunisia was the dialogue that started in, the, uh, in 2005 onwards and so on. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, I do not embrace this kind of you know, deterministic uh, connections between a certain political culture or, politi or, or, or legacy and the political evolution later on. Stephen or Rachel, would you like to also take on the same question? Um, can I say something back on the nation state? Would sure, and then Stephen. Right? <laughs> um, with our talk about the nation state, I, I think we're leaving out a really important global trend, which is the nation state in its various forms is undergoing privatization. Right, the social sectors, public sectors, I mean, this is a, a global trend. It's not specific to the US or the Middle East, is undergoing privatization. So we, we are kind of reifying the nation state as this functioning entity, and, and we're leaving out these trends that, that are pretty uniform all over the place, um, which is why, very much in agreement with different nuances of my, my fellow panelists, I say the first thing is to turn the very resources, the very social sector and public sector that's undergoing privatization by a smaller and smaller um, cadre of companies, turn that over first, especially in places um, of um, instability. Turn that over first to local oversight and control. Right, take that piece of the nation state that's waning everywhere. And um, I, I spoke more about oil, but I think a really key site, whether the Middle East or, or globally, is that the water should belong to the people living above it or around it, and that should not undergo privatization. And to Mr. Arakat's um, point, I would say a kind of a key point um, for Palestinian sovereignty was that the mountain aquifer um, and riparian rights to the Jordan River 
right, should first of all um, be um, conferred upon Palestinian residents, you know, as a key stage towards greater independence. So, so I think this whole nation state, let's not forget what's going on and let's hang on to that, first of all, for the, for the people present. Stephen. Um, I, I have thoughts on all of these issues and I actually, I wish my wife was here because I'm gonna pass on offering my thoughts because I know there are more questions in the thing. She's never seen me giving up an opportunity to speak, but <laughs> you know, I'm gonna do that. I'm glad this is being tweeted. Maybe she'll be following. <laughs> no. Okay, uh, yes. And then one, two, three. Yes. Fifth row on the right. Yeah. So, okay, my name is Maurizio Geri, I'm a PhD candidate in Old Dominion University in Virginia. I'm from Italy, so I am among the Europeans that say now after 100 years it's time for the US to oh, nice. do something. <laughs> but not as imperial power, as facilitator from outside. Now, we all agree that uh, the state should be built as a multinational and multi-ethnic state, not a mono-ethnic state. We are interested in Europe to learn because in multiculturalism is failed. Is failing in Europe. So instead of teaching us, we should learn from other countries. So my question is, what are the models? Because in the Middle East, I don't see many inclusive states. Saudi Arabia, Israel, Turkey are very exclusionary nation state. And I think in the Muslim world, there is Indonesia that is a democratic state and is quite inclusive. Uh, earlier, someone said about the United States, I don't think it can be repeated, but Canada, for example, is another country that we can learn. But what are, according to you, the models that we should look to to search for a democratic, inclusive state and not only a mono-ethnic national state? question. Yeah, so the question is, what is the model? What to is whom? The, to whom? Uh, Joseph or whoever. I mean, okay. I, 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 who wants to answer? Okay. Who wants okay. to answer? Okay. Stephen, Stephen will take this question. I mean, first and foremost, like we are, exactly, we are <laughs> in search we of a state model. that is worth of the state, name of the state. Okay, <laughs> this gentleman. Uh, Ken Meyercourt, World Docs. Uh, was the Syrian Socialist Nationalist Party uh, founded in response to Sykes-Picot in its broadest sense? And what are the current prospects for the party as one of the two entities, along with the Islamic State, who reject the Sykes-Picot derived borders? Um, Again, to in whom? that they call for a greater Syria comprised of what is currently Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Mandate Palestine. To whom you are asking the question again? Anyone who's heard of the Syrian Na Socialist Nationalist Party. Okay. <laughs> and the third question, yes, back there. Hi, Rachel Oswald, uh, Congressional Quarterly. This question is for Shadi, but anybody else who wants to men uh, answer it. You urged more U.S. engagement in the region, and I'm curious how the U.S. goes about doing that without necessarily more military involvement. Um, Saudi Arabia, for example, has been taking on a much bigger role. Um, the assistance the UAE gave with Saudi support in suppressing the Bahrain democracy uprising and that other Gulf countries have given to the Sisi government in many ways is seen to have weakened U.S. leverage um, in those two specific Arab, Arab Spring countries. Uh, well, we are wrapping up. If there is a last question, I will take it. Otherwise, uh, we'll be wrapping up. Uh, Stephen, the first question. Thank you. Now, I'm going to take my opportunity here because when someone talks about the, a model in the Middle East, it's like dropping a quarter in me, and I get very, very upset. Um, I, I, as someone who spends a lot of time, in addition to working on the Arab world, working on Turkey, I was struck after the Arab uprisings about all of this discussion of the Turkish model this and the Turkish model that. I, it, 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 given all of the kind of political pathologies in Turkey presently and, and at that Come time, just, um, I think the, it was uh, kind of romantic to imagine this, you know, predominantly Muslim, economically developing, sort of kind of, but not really democratic country as somehow being a model. This was a way, and the whole idea, think about what model is. Model is a simplification of reality to help us understand extraordinarily complex situations or systems. And I don't think you can pick out a country that has a very specific kind of history, a specific kind of culture. I know we're not supposed to talk about culture when we talk about the Middle East, but it's there. A specific culture, a specific history, a specific kind of politics and economics and physical reality and say this is a model of another country. What does Indonesia, other than the fact that it's the largest Muslim country in the world, have anything to do really with Egypt? 
It doesn't seem to me. In addition to, like Shetty talked about this kind of patronizing attitude, I feel extraordinarily uncomfortable saying to Arabs, to Egyptians, to Algerians, to Palestinians, to whomever, to Iraqis, this other country that is somewhere different from where you are is a model for how you should develop, as if suggesting that Arabs themselves don't have the capacity to build strong, neutral political institutions and so on and so forth. Thus far, it's been a huge problem uh, in, in the Arab world, and there's a, a variety of countervailing forces that have made that a problem. But the idea of the search for a model for the Arab world for its political development seems to me to be strange uh, and, and unnecessary and one in which we will never arrive at and say, oh, this is the model for, for the Arab world. Somebody, somebody mentioned Tunisia before. The idea that Tunisia, this is an, another new thing in Washington, will be a demonstration effect for the rest of the region seems it gets the whole argument about demonstration effects completely backwards. So I think that this is, um, I don't think it's a great uh, question. I told you, just like dropping a quarter in me gets <laughs> angry. I'm happy to talk about the US role, but the question was directed to Shadi. Uh, well, if you want to... No, no, let's chat okay. answer it, and then I'll... Uh, Imad, Idan <laughs> wants to come in. I'm going to shut up. Yes, very quickly, just to appreciate the opportunity that we missed speaking about a model. That's not a model or anything, but that was an opportunity that was really, was really missed. The Arab uprising themselves and what they stood for and their potential for reconfiguring the entire region and even the classification of the region and the labeling of the region from moderates versus radicals, our allies and our adversaries, into nations, free, democratic states that can associate with the rest of the universal community, with the rest of the world, based on shared values that actually the Arab uprisings in different countries called for freedom, economic growth, and dignity, and building democratic societies. That was an excellent opportunity. Just as a conclusion, I would conclude, if you would like even to compare it with Sykes-Picot and the aftermath, or even the area that, 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 that preceded Sykes-Picot, it came also against the backdrop of Arab revolts in 1916 in the Arabian Peninsula, of course, for specific political reasons, 1920 in Syria, uh, Yusuf al-Azma, and, and others. So uh, the, the, all of these revolts were, were suppressed. And I think what happened in 2011 is a very similar trajectory, that most of these aspirations have been also suppressed. That was, could have been a model that the Arabs would have built, Arab states would have built for themselves, democratic and free nations. Well, before I get to the third question, to Shadi, who had, among the panelists, who have heard of the Syrian Nationalist Party, Syrian Socialist Party, and also willing to respond to the second question? I'm afraid that uh, if I say yes, probably it will be... Okay. <laughs> uh, no, because, I mean, uh, yeah, I know this party quite well. Um, look, this party is one of, is one among many parties in, in the Levant that contest the, the Sykes-Picot. You said uh, only with ISIS, but the Basque party is also contesting the Sykes-Picot order. All these parties are in the club of what we mentioned. I mean, these political forces during the last decades that were really protesting the order as it was. Now, specifically on the, the SSNP, it is a very small political group, not even a party in Lebanon and in Syria. Uh, judging by its electoral, uh, I mean, performance in Lebanon, for example, frankly, I don't see a very bright future. Um, besides that, one has to say, probably you're a sympathizer. I don't know, I don't want to, I mean, to enter into these <laughs> details, but this party is very much uh, informed by the climate of the 30s. Uh, I don't need to give much more details than that. It's a proto-fascist uh, party that believes in political violence. It is it's a party that has been condemned several times in Lebanese history for plotting coup d'etats. So frankly, I don't think that this is a pattern for a democratic and liberal future in the Middle East. Shadi. This is my opinion, at least. Shadi. OK, so on the last question. so. We, we say a, th a lot of things like, um, oh, um, Arab nations should take responsibility for their own region. Let's step back so others can step in. This is sort of Obama's approach to the Middle East. You know what? I don't want others to step in. And I have to be honest with that. The current Arab nations that we have, I don't want them playing a more active, muscular, aggressive role in their own region. We have the misfortune of having terrible allies. I don't think we should be outsourcing US policy to disastrous allies. That's sort of my starting point. But you know, <laughs> um, 
but look, people say, well, we've tried everything in the Middle East. Actually, we haven't. There's one thing left that we have never tried. It's called consistently and seriously supporting democracy in the Middle East. To me, that is the fundamental question. Um, apparently, the D word isn't very popular in this town or in a lot of other places, but that is the one thing we have left to try. And I'll just end by saying, you know, so but what would that really mean in practice? Well, I mean, we have leverage with our allies, the ones that we support to the tune of billions of dollars. You know, I'm a little bit old, maybe I'm a little bit old fashioned on this. I don't think that we should be supporting military coups against democratically elected leaders. That's what we do. That's what we have done. Let's stop doing that. Yet let's use our leverage to say to our allies, if you want an additional pot of money, you have to actually show progress on clear indicators on democracy and human rights. And if you don't, there are going to be consequences. Um, that's not to say there isn't a role for the US military. Um, I think that we should have targeted the Assad regime four years ago. And I, um, you know, that, that to me would have made a very big difference at a very crucial time when Syrian rebels had momentum. But it's not just targeting the Assad regime. It's also the role that we can play in helping build or rebuild a Syrian, a Syrian rebel army. A colleague of mine put the price tag on this at um, three to $10 billion a year for at least two to five years. Maybe he was underestimating. But the fact that we're not willing to talk about those numbers, which in, in, in sort of the context of US GDP are a pittance, the fact that we are not willing to have this conversation in our country is to me remarkable. Uh, well, thank you very much. I mean, Rachel, do you want to also say, you know, say a few things before we conclude? Um, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, it was a, definitely a, a, rousing, um, a rousing statement um, there from Shadi, so I'm absorbing it, as I'm, I'm sure um, all of you are as well. But, you know, what we're, I said it before, but we're talking about states as if they're in a vacuum as if the only interests at stakes are, uh, are political. And in fact, it's, it's not entirely the case. And, um, you know, and again, for example, um, it, it's not simply a question of the US providing aid. It's a question of durable partnerships. And durable partnerships have to be um, negotiated on the basis of the people who are present, the people who are in the struggle, that those stakes in winning are their own. Um, the reason why I think Iraq was such a disaster in the, in the aftermath is that those contracts, with the, the Kurdish exception, were renegotiated as if there wasn't a need for on-the-ground nation building. And so it kind of happened again as a kind of a Sykes-Picot deja vu, as if somehow sovereignty could be configured without the people there with the majority stake in their resources, in their government, in their sovereignty, and in the political power. So I think it's, it's not only going in there, but I think it's really the moment for an assessment of how finances have worked and how the Middle East has served as an extractive region for so many global companies. And it's the time to change that relationship and that that relationship, I think, in, in really dramatic ways could reconfigure the political arena. Yeah, I, I just wanna, I wanna respond a bit on this question of, of, of the United States in, in the region. And I think that it's easy to caricature some of the arguments. It's part of my stock and trade that goes on here in, in, in Washington, D.C. But I think that there's an extraordinarily important issue that's on the table, which is how much does the United States, what kind of expenditures <laughs> does the United States devote to issues, and how those can make a difference in the lives of Middle Easterners, especially given the issue that we started with today, which is Sykes-Picot and, uh, and, and the way people have imagined it, and the very real role that foreigners have played uh, in the region. And I think, you know, Shadi makes a, an interesting point about leverage, and that you would think that we would have leverage given the extraordinary amount of resources that we've spent over a period of time. And, and take, you know, my favorite country besides my own, which is Egypt, and that, you know, over the course of 
since the 1940s, more than $80 billion have been poured in American aid, whether it's direct food aid assistance or military aid or economic aid. At its high point in the mid-1980s, $2.2 billion a year, now settled back at about $1.5 billion a year. That should give us some leverage, but we actually have a test case here, and that is that it's true the President of the United States was, how shall I say, ambivalent about the military intervention in July 2013, but felt that it was necessary, in fact, to respond to this, although the U.S. government's never referred to it as a coup, which it is, apologies to Egyptians, um, that they did suspend military assistance. They did suspend the delivery of major weapon systems to Egypt over the course of a year and a half. Now, that neither made Egypt more democratic nor less unstable. And the idea that we should somehow, and I'm not, this is not a, I'm, I'm certainly not advocating for, uh, for the Egyptian government. In fact, my problem with the Obama administration is its departure from its commitment to it, upholding its own values when it comes to uh, the changes going on in the region. But I think it's important to understand that our bad allies in the region have provided actors like Abdel Fattah Sisi options so that we could take our $1.5 billion off of the table, yet that's more than made up by Emiratis and Saudis and Kuwaitis and Russians and French who are more than willing to sell the Egyptians what they want. So it, 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 that is a way of actually, you can, I'm not saying it's definitely, but it is a way in which you can imagine the United States leaving the region rather than becoming more engaged, uh, more engaged in the region. Again, it's not an, it's not an advocacy for Abdel Fattah Sisi and the regime in Egypt. I mean, my God, who would be an advocate for this kind of regime? But I think we need to think through what the implications are of kind of Congress. discussions of leverage and leadership and political will and what those things actually mean. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much, all the panelists, for this great discussion. And thank you very much, all of you, for joining us on this rainy, <laughs> rainy Friday evening. And also, on behalf of, on, on behalf of Al Sharform, we would like to thank Foreign Affairs, Linda, Elena, and my colleagues, Elena, for putting this event together. So now it's reception until 8.30. Yeah. Thanks.